I have a history when it comes to David Benioff and Dan Weiss, two of the three showrunners of a three-body problem, and I've made many past videos criticizing the duo's work on the later seasons of Game of Thrones. My channel honestly wouldn't be what it is today if they hadn't botched that story so terribly, so when I heard they were adapting another book series, I was definitely hesitant. However, despite how much people hate them, David and Dan have proven that they can be good showrunners with the first four seasons of Game of Thrones. When they're actually passionate about something, and they have a finished book series, then I don't presume them to be bad creators despite me heavily criticizing them in the past. So I'm not coming into the three-body problem wanting to hate the show, and I know this adaptation has some potential. Also for this review, I'm not going to be discussing major spoilers, and will only refer to main story events vaguely, and will occasionally touch on some minor plot beats. So, how was the show? To me, it was fine to good, and there are definitely some great aspects, and some others that weigh the quality of the show down. I think by far the strongest part of the show, and is pretty much indisputable in terms of quality, is the inherent mystery of the story. That's obviously the biggest draw of the three-body problem, in that it has a rich and puzzling narrative with some hardcore science fiction concepts. I think each of those story elements are translated to the show very well, and easily acts as the biggest hook in the series to keep your attention. Like the story starts immediately with a captivating question of what is this countdown, and why are these scientists killing themselves? Which that alone would would carry most shows, but that's only like the first two episodes. Along with there being other mysterious elements, like this VR-like headset that transcends any kind of human technology, the three-body problem from a story perspective is able to consistently engage the viewer with the allure of wanting to know these bewildering conundrums, which is also from my knowledge the primary draw of the book. Although to come clean, I haven't read the trilogy so I'm purely analyzing the show without any bias for the original, and just off of the merits of what makes a show great. Also, along with this riveting narrative, the creators pair it with such an immersive tone. The cinematography gives off this bleak feeling. The music perfectly punctuates the sense of danger and urgency, while also still fitting the sci-fi genre. And the general pace of the story constantly keeps a sense of danger on our protagonists. The overall show instills this dread-like feeling into the audience, and because of this, it creates a great sense of intrigue. In general, I'm really obsessed with Lovecraftian undertones, which basically means there's this powerlessness forced onto our characters as they have to overcome an unknowable and godlike obstacle that trumps any kind of human understanding. In its most basic form, this creates an outstanding conflict that is almost impossible to overcome, and is also very intriguing because we're actively learning about it throughout the story. And this adaptation I think perfectly achieves this point of conflict. The challenges and obstacles raised by the story are genuinely confounding, and seeing characters overcome them was by far the biggest highlight of the show. If you're able to surprise and wow the audience with solutions that make sense, are plausible, and are even clever, then that's an example of some great writing. Although, to be fair, that's more of a compliment to the source material, but the show's inherent subject matter is still going to be enthralling. I don't really see a way in which you can mess that up, however, I do think it could have been better. This is going into an aspect in which I think is one of the show's biggest flaws, in that the science within the show can feel very surface level at times. Now, the concepts raised by the story are fascinating, it's just that they aren't explored or discussed to a great depth. Like, it kind of feels like a cop-out in some scenes, where characters don't really debate most of these topics and dive into the hardcore science. There's this scene where most of our characters meet up and discover one of these VR-like headsets that defies our current technological limits. However, none of them really discuss it to much length, and the dialogue is primarily driven by emotion instead of intellectual discussion. This one character here brings up some interesting questions associated with the topic, but that doesn't actually spawn a discussion and it peters out right away. When these people are supposed to be the brightest minds in the world, you would think they would act and talk differently. However, they're written to be more crude and emotionally outbursty, instead of being driven by a desire and wanting to know more about this mind-bending technology. From a writing perspective, this is by far the biggest challenge because if you're not a proficient scientist in said field, it's hard to write compelling science-based dialogue when you only have a degree in film studies. This is why a show like Better Call Saul is so amazing because the writers consult with actual lawyers and that adds a level of authenticity to the scripts. For a three-body problem, 
A lot of the dialogue associated with the science comes off as basic explanations of said theories and concepts. It feels as though the writers just have a Wikipedia understanding of a topic and are only applying that knowledge to the dialogue. Like, we should be getting blown away by these characters' intellect, and you can argue that you can lose the audience because of that, but as long as you aren't using an incomprehensibly complex vocabulary, then the audience should be able to follow along just fine. Another example of this surface-level writing is in the first episode, where these two scientists just throw their title at this random person, and we're expected to think that they're really smart. I'm a senior researcher in the theoretical physics group at Imperial College. I'm doing a meta-study analyzing the results of particle accelerator experiments around the world. Nice one. All the while, there is this certain topic of this particle accelerator that produced head-scratching results that they never really dive into or explain at all. Which, that should be something that these really smart characters would talk about with ease. Or there's even this example in episode 2, where after this unexplainable world event happens, the characters don't really debate about the topic much, and one of them even says that it was possibly a deepfake. Which doesn't make sense at all since deepfakes have nothing to do with said event. There are some examples of the writing hitting a satisfying depth that can be great, but most of the time it's in relation to the major story events, like the explanation of the three-body problem. Instead of the in-between scenes of characters discussing said topics in a more casual manner. I haven't read the book, so I'm not sure how much dialogue-based discussions there are, but what we got in the show was pretty underwhelming. This is actually kind of similar to the later seasons of Game of Thrones, where we had really smart characters that had a decline in intellect because the writers weren't able to sustain their wit consistently. I get that same feeling here in the three-body problem, although to be fair, it wasn't nearly as bad. The dialogue is never extremely jarring in a way the dialogue is in season 8 of Game of Thrones, and the worst it ever gets is that it's passable. Just in my opinion, it doesn't achieve a satisfying depth that you would expect from an insanely smart roster of characters. It feels more like they're smart because of their actions in the story and what they're able to achieve, instead of how they talk and act. I could go into more examples of this, but I think this overall issue is kind of carried by the fact of how strong and captivating the overall story is. Which going into some story events vaguely, episode 5 was the moment in the show that completely sold me. Up until that point, I was kind of meandering around a state of partially enjoying the show, but there's a certain thing that happens that is extremely shocking. To say the least, it's an incredible scene and I would implore you to at least finish episode 5 if you weren't entirely sold like I was. That boat set piece blew me away, and I'm really happy that David and Dan showed that entire scene without cutting away. It goes to a very dark place that I didn't think would happen, and drastically changes the dynamics between certain characters. Along with just the way it was executed with excellent VFX and a combination of some great practical elements. Truly a memorable scene that I'll keep thinking about after the show. But besides that one incredible scene, episode 5 kind of acts like the end of a season which feels weird structurally, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. The entire show essentially pivots from a hard-boiled investigation into a full-on existential threat that everyone has to overcome. Personally, I prefer that second half because I adore that problem-solving aspect, akin to Contact, Arrival, or The Martian. Even though I wish there was a lot more of that, along with what I raised earlier where there needs to be more depth with the dialogue scenes. Because to me, that's by far the most interesting aspect, and why I'm essentially here. But I'm assuming that season 2 is going to go hard. While on the topic of the season structure, let's go into the pace. The pace for a three-body problem felt a little too fast at times, and some of my favorite moments were the more slowed-down dialogue scenes, where characters could actually discuss certain topics at great length. Like Jonathan Price's character talking to the Lord about the concept of lying and deceit, and Will and Saul's emotional discussion. For this scene in particular, it's literally just six minutes of two people talking, and it was by far my favorite scene in the show. It's a minor spoiler for Will's character, but he had an illness and he essentially wants to give up his life for a goal in the story. In this discussion, Saul tries his hardest to make an argument for Will to not agree to a procedure. It's a captivating scene because it's laced with desperation, love, and pure tragedy. While on Will's side, it's contrasted with hope, levity, and bluntness. Every argument that Saul raises explores different and interesting perspectives related to the issue. 
which this is something that I wish happened in almost every single dialogue scene. This singular type of scene should have been more abundant, but applied to different deep sci-fi concepts. Then there's one more aspect that elevates the scene even higher, in which Will has to give his consent five times in a row for verification, and this in turn, escalates the desperation even more. It structures the scene in a way in which through each argument that Saul loses, Will gets closer to giving his life away. It's truly a great dialogue scene, and this episode was written by David and Dan. So to me, this is essentially proof that they can write good scenes when they're trying. It kind of reminds me of that great 5 minute discussion between Cersei and Robert Baratheon that was purely original content. So overall, if the pace was a bit slower and we had more of these types of scenes that allowed the cool scientific concepts to be explored with different and unique perspectives, then I think the show could have been much greater. That and this kind of goes hand in hand with another issue in which the characters needed to be more consistently utilized. Currently in this adaptation, it feels like there's always a select few characters that remain and lie dormant, until they are needed in the story. As an example, Will and Saul don't really have a purpose in the season until the very end. Meaning that, whenever they had any scenes throughout the season, it always felt like the progression of the story hit a brick wall. Especially since the direction in which these characters are going didn't have build up at times. Like the wall facer Ploppy literally comes out of nowhere, and finally gives Saul a purpose when he wasn't utilized in the season outside of character interactions. Ideally in a story, each one of your main characters should have something to do on an episode by episode basis, or at worst, every other episode. This entangles them and makes them relevant within the narrative, while also developing them as a character as they overcome obstacles. In the first season, that feels sloppily done sometimes because some characters will disappear, or you'll not know what their importance is. Like for Will's scenes where he's sick, I came really close to fast forwarding through them because they weren't currently adding anything to the overall story. This feels like a core issue with adapting the source material because writing arcs for characters that stay consistently relevant within the narrative takes a lot of planning. That and from my understanding, there's a lot more characterization in this adaptation, which some of it is pretty good. Like Augie's internal struggle in the first couple of episodes is pretty riveting, and each of the characters has some kind of minor conflict to overcome. It's nothing groundbreaking that makes me absolutely adore a certain character, but none of them are bad by any means. Although, there is an absolute clear standout, which is Liam Cunningham as Thomas Wade. He's just so charismatic, intelligent, and commands so much screen presence. Literally whenever he shows up, he steals the scene instantaneously, and is absolutely magnetizing. Which this kind of blindsided me because I wasn't expecting him to be this amazing. To be fair though, his character is just pure bliss when it comes to writing an interesting but flawed character. He has such a great confidence and is a constant beacon of power, and a character who never gives up. He's the definition of a perfect leader and I'd honestly would just watch the second season for his performance alone. Benedict Wong as well I think is always great. He has an excellent subtle weight to his acting, and any humor he has to deliver is always done with absolute ease. Really the cast in general was a pure delight, and I thought I would dislike John Bradley's crude character, but I even came to enjoy him as well. I think he offers a nice source of levity and comedic relief in this otherwise bleak story. And in particular, the way he acts in that simulation world was perfect because it highlights his gamer characteristics. Him choking out that random person was golden, and is exactly how a spontaneous gamer would act. Jonathan Price also finally essentially plays the same character he does in Game of Thrones, but he's still as lovely as ever. Also, I forgot to mention that Ramin Jawadi did the score of the show, and I thought it was pretty good. It isn't as iconic as Game of Thrones or Westworld, but to be fair, those two shows have insanely high bars. They also haven't released the soundtrack in full yet, so it's kind of hard to analyze it on its own. Overall, I think that the Three Body Problem is a pretty enjoyable show that may have some flaws, but it's definitely carried by the thoroughly intriguing story. Right now, the show is sitting at a 6 to 7 out of 10 for me, and I'm excited for season 2 given the future conflict of the show. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this adaptation, like people boycotting David and Dan for how they handled Game of Thrones, and the fact that the source material is predominantly in a Chinese setting, but none of those things bother me. The adaptation I think was really solid, and the changes to make it a more international threat, and to keep it up to date technologically, were all great changes. 
Currently, I think the show is mostly overhated for the prior reasons, and if you're on the fence about wanting to watch it, then I'd recommend at least getting to episode 5. Thank you for watching, and my letterbox, Patreon, and Discord links are in the description. As always, thank you immensely to Logan Farmer for achieving the top tier on Patreon.